And I'm delighted to introduce our third plenary speaker, Dr. Talithia Williams. Dr. Williams earned her BS in mathematics from Spelman University, a master's degree in math from Howard, and a master's and a PhD in statistics from Rice University. She's now an associate professor at Harvey Mudd College, researching in statistics, with a focus on developing statistical models that show the spatial and temporal structure of data, as well as applying statistics to problems in the environment. Dr. Williams has worked with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, NSA, and NASA, and has also partnered with the World Health Organization. Dr. Williams is an award-winning mathematician and educator. She has served on the boards of MAA and SACNIS and is on the board of the EDGE Foundation. She received the 2015 Henry L. Alder Award for exemplary teaching by an early career mathematics professor and was the AWM MAA Falconer Lecturer in 2017. Some of her extraordinary accomplishments include a highly viewed 2014 TED Talk called Own Your Body's Data. She's hosted a six-part PBS series, Nova Wonders, in 2018, and a five-part series, Nova Universe Revealed, in 2021, and has authored the book, Power and Numbers, The Rebel Women of Mathematics. Dr. Williams will be receiving the 2022 Joint Policy Board Mathematics Communication Award for, quote, bringing mathematics and statistics into the homes of millions through her work as a TV host, renowned speaker, and author. It's with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Talithia Williams. Yay! Thank you for the virtual hand clap. I'm so excited to be with you all today. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and we will jump right in. I have a funny story to, to share. You mentioned um, Nova Universe, uh, the universe revealed and um, yeah, ask that question at the end. Somebody put that in the chat, share that Nova story. Um, but let's jump right in. I wanna talk to you about power and numbers, the rebel women of mathematics. Um, but first I wanna just start by sharing a little bit about me. So um, drop in the chat where I am in this picture. This is my junior high school, so middle school, eighth grade. Yes, it's in the, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can see my name down there at the bottom, but um, the glasses also give it away. But I love showing this picture because in middle school and even high school, I was, I was very regular. Like I wasn't super nerdy. I mean, I was like, you know, wanted to do cheer and wanted to do all these other fun things that, um, you know, that we want to do at that stage in life. Um, and so there was, there was, everything was very normal about my upbringing. There wasn't like, you know, I wasn't doing STEM camp or, you know, math camp in the eighth grade. You may do that. That's fantastic. But I, I, I was not. Um, <clears throat> I was in a pre-algebra class my eighth grade year. And halfway through the class, I wanted to move into algebra because I felt like I was ready. I was doing so well in pre-algebra. I might as well just go into algebra in January of my eighth grade year. And uh, my teacher, she said, okay, Talithia, yeah, go ahead, go into algebra. And I was so excited because it was the only algebra class in my entire high school of about 1500 students. And there were very few black students, like it was two other black students and then I joined. And so I was just like, wow, I'm in algebra. Um, and that first six weeks I failed. Like I was clearly not prepared. I didn't know what they were doing with variables. I mean, I just like was not doing well in algebra. And um, <clears throat> I remember talking to my mom about it and she was just like, well, Talithia, maybe you should just go back to pre-algebra. And I was like, nope, I will just walk out before I like hang my head and go back to my pre-algebra class. And I stuck with it. I started um, meeting with my teacher, Mr. Bell. And um, by the end of the year, I remember him telling me, you know, Talithia, I'm so glad to see that you persevered because you came in at a disadvantage, right? You've missed half the class. Yes, you were doing great in pre-algebra, but that's not the same as, you know, doing well in algebra. Um, and I stuck it out, even though I was behind. And so I love sharing that story because really it is, it's, it's been telling of my math journey it has been all about perseverance, all about sticking it out, pushing through even in, in spite of difficulty. Um, in high school, my 11th grade and 12th grade year, I was a grocery store cashier, just at a local grocery store in Columbus, Georgia. And um, 
And uh, one thing that I would do to pass the time was I would try to calculate how much change someone owed me uh, when they gave me cash. Most people paid with cash. This is back in the 90s. And, and so uh, I would sort of do mental math to pass the time. Like you'd hand me a 20 and I'd be like, oh, okay, your change is $4.32. Like I'd try to, you know, unbeknownst to me though, it was actually helping my math skills because I was getting used to just doing, you know, math at, at work. Um, also in the 90s were when advanced placement classes first came out. Just give me a, a thumbs up if you've ever taken a, an AP class before. Yes, 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 exactly. So in the 90s, like AP classes were just starting out and they were trying to encourage students to take them. They were like, take these classes, you can get college credit. A is worth five, you know, credits. And so um, my friends and I, we would flock to take the AP classes because they weren't much different than honors, quite frankly. That just stays in this room. Um, but I took AP Calculus. And um, in AP Calculus, my teacher, Mr. Dorman, he would call people to the board. He'd be like, come to the board and work problems for extra credit. And I was always working problems for extra credit. And so one day after class, he asked me to, to hang around. He said, you know, hey, Talithia, um, you know, you're really talented in math. You should think about majoring in it when you go to college. And I thought, well, clearly he hasn't graded my exam because if he had he would know that i'm not talented in about um but then the way he said like you know not if you go to college but when you go you should major in math and this really struck me one because mr norman was an old white guy um and so you know i didn't i didn't see any reason for him to have to affirm my mathematical ability but then too, because in his mind, he could see me as a mathematician, even though I didn't really know anybody who looked like me who did mathematics. And so that was really a pivotal moment for me. I ended up at Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. Spelman is a historically black college for women. And here I am pictured with the late Dr. Etta Faulkner. She was one of my mentors and one of my professors at Spelman. And so it was when I got to Spelman that I first met black women mathematicians and all of a sudden, you know, this seed that Mr. Dorman had planted became reality. Like, oh, I can do math. Look, here are all these professors here who are mathematicians. And so that was really transformative for me because I, up until that point, you know, yes, I was good in math, but I didn't know if I was good enough to be a math major. And I got to see that at Spelman. Um, I also started a, a PhD program at Howard University and I started in mathematics, theoretical mathematics and took a stats course and then fell in love with statistics. And then I transferred to a stats PhD program. But when I left Spelman, I did the EDGE program. I know you've heard about EDGE, uh, you know, the past couple of days. Um, this is actually the, from the summer of 2000. My gosh, y'all, 20, it'll be 22 years ago. So this was the summer that I did EDGE. It was the summer right after I graduated from Spelman. Um, EDGE is a program for women who are entering PhD programs, of course, in the mathematical sciences. It's amazing. You should totally apply. Um, I'm still close with women in that cohort. You know, it was so wonderful to go through that grad experience together with these, you know, women that I got to form a bond with over the summer. So if you are graduating, you're entering a PhD program in the mathematical sciences, it could be math, OR, stats, whatever, you should definitely apply to the EDGE summer program. I'm a little jealous that you're going to be at Oxford this summer, um, but yeah, definitely check that out. I spent three summers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and um, it was here that I, I got to do research. I didn't do an REU. Um, <clears throat> my research experiences were through NASA. So every summer, the summers after my uh, freshman, sophomore, and junior year, I came to work at JPL. And it was very intimidating. I mean, I was in, I was in Lonnie Lane's lab the first summer, and Lonnie's a little short guy, and um, I remember meeting him, and he said, hey, uh, Talithia, I'm Lonnie, and I'd be, I was like, hello, Dr. Lane, and he was like, no, call me Lonnie, and I was like, I can't do that, Dr. Lane, I'm so sorry, like, I'm from Georgia, and I have to, like, put respect on your, you know, I mean, it was just so funny to, like, be in California and be in this environment where everyone was on a first-name basis. What I loved about Lonnie's lab was that he invited everyone to the table. So, you know, he had maybe about four or five of us that were his research students over the summer. And, you know, we would literally be like sitting in the back or sitting to the side or just trying to be as hidden as possible because we didn't feel like we 
had the, the, the you know, the, the caliber of, you know, degrees to be at the table, to be uh, having these conversations, these research conversations. And he would always say, no, I really want to hear from the summer students because you come with this fresh perspective. Um, and you often have ideas that we've never thought about. And he was so right. And so I was so excited to be at JP Hill. Claudia was my mentor. So I got assigned a mentor and Claudia and I would um, have lunch together once a week. We'd go get our hair done together. Uh, she really just excited me about the possibility of doing research and to see someone who looked like me who was working at NASA was amazing. Um, so I love spending time with her and hanging out with her and just talking to her about grad school. She was the one who initially planted the seed in me to go to grad school. And so I was really inspired by her, but also motivated by her. Um, I shared a little bit about this on the panel, you know, graduate school, you know, what the idea of what I thought it would be versus the reality of what it was, was so different. There were so many moments where I felt out of place, right? I felt like that square peg trying to fit into the circle. Um, and, and part of it just had to do with the graduate school culture, right? Being the only female and the only African-American um, in my cohort year made it challenging to just instantly find friends, right? Imagine coming from Spelman where anywhere I look, I've got a study buddy and a partner and, you know, um, to an environment where it really took a lot of work and effort to find people to, to do grad school with. Um, because as you, as you heard from the panel, you know, graduate school is all about building those relationships. It's not something that you can do alone. And so you need those friendships with the folks that you come into. And so I really had to work hard to craft those friendships. Part of what made it challenging though, I'll share and experience my fourth year as a graduate student. I was so excited to be going to a math conference like on my own. And this was in my area, it was in my field. It was a stats conference. My advisor was excited. Uh, she couldn't go, but she sent me to this conference. And I'm so like at this point, just like geeked out, right? So I've literally got the books that the authors had written that were gonna be at this conference. I was gonna like have them sign it. Like, please sign this book. I live in the statistical inference book if I could just get your signature on it, right? So um, I come to this conference, it was in Chicago, it was hosted by Northwestern, it was at this hotel, and you know, I'm excited to be in the stats community, sort of for the first time, you know, as a researcher in, in my sub-discipline. And I, I get on the elevator, and a guy's on the elevator, and um, he, he sort of looks straight ahead. And uh, I'm like, hey, good morning, and he's like, hello. And um, he's like, I'm going to the lower level. I was like, me too, <laughs> yeah, you know. And so we get out and uh, we sort of both are walking in tandem up to the registration table and we walk up and the woman looks up and she looks at him and she looks at me and then she looks at him and she looks back at me and she says, ma'am, are you at the right conference? Cause there's another one right down the hall. And I thought, well, how like the sign is huge. Like, how do you miss this huge sign? How do you accidentally walk up to the wrong registration table? Um, and I was like, well, no, I think, yeah, this is where I'm supposed to be. And, you know, and I was like, that was weird that she only asked me that, you know. So anyway, I didn't think about it. I walked over to the continental breakfast table and started, you know, putting stuff on my plate, had my name tag on and elevator dude comes over and he like leans and he looks at my name tag and he goes, oh, you're at Rice University. Do you know David Scott and so-and-so? And, and I was thinking, well, dude, I just tried to talk to you on the elevator and you didn't have three words for me, you know? But somehow it felt like this badge was justifying my, you speaking to me now. And so that wasn't the best welcome to the stats community. I remember calling my advisor just like, if this is what it's like to be in statistics, I don't want to do it. Like I, you know, I don't want to be in the, like it was already crazy because there were no other, you know, black women at this conference. Um, but I always felt like people thought I was in the wrong place, right? Like, what are you doing here? Are you sure you're not lost? Maybe you're turned around. And so that really um, colored my perspective of the discipline because I thought like, I want to be at a place that sees me and sees the value that I can bring to the community. Well, I stuck it out. I finished my PhD from Rice in Statistics. Um, this was one of the highlights. Uh, this is my graduation day. Notice in the bottom right-hand corner there, you'll see a little infant. Yes, we had a two-week-old baby in tow. 
Um, that's my oldest, Josiah, who is now 13. I'm actually in his bedroom. So if he barges in, you'll get to see, you know, that was then, this is now. Um, and uh, I'm at Harvey Mudd College. One thing I love about Harvey Mudd is that we really try to um, hire faculty that reflect our students. We really want our students to see themselves as mathematicians, to look at our department and think they can do mathematics, that anybody is able and has the ability to do math and be successful in it. And so um, I love being in this department with these amazing people. And then this picture is maybe about five years old, but this is my family. I've got three boys, my husband, and then my mom uh, and a father-in-law there. All right, so now that we're warmed up, get your fingers ready because I want to see your chat comments. Who is this? This is like a easy question. Who is this person? Who is this person? Come on, chat. Who is it? Yes, Brianna, thank you. Come on, Sarah. Yes, yes. I feel like I'm on Facebook Live and they're like, yes, I see you, Autumn. Come on, CJ. It is Rosa Parks. Uh-huh. What's she known for? Civil rights movement, not giving up her seat on the back of the bus, right? We celebrate her. We've got stamps. Everybody's the day she got arrested. You know, she's been honored. Yes, yes, beautiful contribution. Who is this young girl? Put your guesses in the chat because I didn't know who she was until recently. So at your stage, I would have been like, I don't know. I might have thought that was an old picture of me. Zoe, girl, Zoe, yes, Zoe. You should have waited for other people to answer because you're like, it's Claudette Colvin, hello. I needed to see some, anybody else? Y'all like, nope, we're going with Zoe. Everyone is gonna up her vote. This is Claudette Colvin. What, do, what is Claudette Colvin known for? I guess Zoe's the only one who knows, but. <laughs> she was one of, yes, one of the first people to do what Rosa Parks did. Yes, yes, Miss Wantha. Uh, I'm, no, 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 I'll say Tanvi, Tanvi. Yes, yes, absolutely. So she also did not give up her seat um, nine months before Rosa Parks. So prior to Rosa Parks, there was Claudette Colvin. Claudette Colvin is still alive today, y'all. She's still uh, alive. Um, she was actually one of the plaintiffs whose, uh, whose name was on the case that went before the Supreme Court, which eventually overturned segregated buses in Montgomery. So why do I bring up Claudette Colvin? Well, you know, why this history lesson? Well, in some ways, you know, Claudette Colvin was like a hidden figure, right? She came along did her part, but she really helped set the stage for Rosa Parks. How many of you saw the movie Hidden Figures? Thumbs up, hands up. Anybody see Hidden Figures? Yes. I saw it and I was just like, this movie's amazing. I worked at NASA. I had no idea that there were people before like me and Claudia who worked at NASA. So uh, if you haven't seen it, um, the movie Hidden Figures celebrates well, not just African-American women, but women who were really um, instrumental in the U.S.'s space race and NASA's space race to, you know, get us to the moon first. And often their contributions were just unknown until this movie came out. It was largely unknown. And so um, here is one of my favorite clips from the movie. I'm going to share that with you now. So we have the vehicle speed, the launch window, and for argument's sake, the landing zone is the Bahamas. Should be enough to figure the go, no go? Yeah, in theory, sir. We need to be past theory at this point. We'll be able to calculate a go, no go with that information. When exactly is that going to happen? Catherine? Have a go at it. The goal point for re-entry is 2,990 miles from where we want Colonel Glenn to land. If we assume that's the Bahamas, 544 miles per hour, 46.56 degrees, 2,990 miles. Okay, so that puts your landing zone at five, Point zero six six seven degrees north, seven seven point three 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 degrees west, which is here. 
Give or take 20 square miles. I like your numbers. Yay. So <clears throat> the where I want to sort of go from with the rest of the talk is really to talk about how do we start to address these issues, especially as mathematical scientists, as women, um, how is it that we can sort of rebel against what's come before us so that we can change the outlook of mathematics for the future for those who are coming behind us. Um, so three points that I want to leave you with today. Um, first, I think we have to engage a broad audience in the beauty of STEM, right? And so many of us love mathematics. Lots of us also love uh, science and technology and engineering as well. And so it's important for us to make sure that we're reaching a diverse group of people, that we're bringing other women into the fold as well. Um, uh, Joan and I talked about this during our panel uh, on Friday, and we talked about sort of how as mathematicians, we also function as moms and how we try to engage people around us. And so I call this neighborhood engagement because it's really about how do you get the people who are closest to you, whether that's your family or your friends or your community, how do you first engage that audience in math, right? Bring them into the mathemat mathematical community. So uh, the way I do this with my family, uh, you know, we 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 tend to do Christmas big, like we're like big Christmas celebrate angels, you know. Um, but a couple of years ago, my father-in-law passed away, and he lived with us at the time. He'd been living with us for two years after my mother-in-law had passed away. And so uh, when Papa passed, we didn't really want to have Christmas at our house. Like he passed around Thanksgiving, and we just kind of wanted to like outsource Christmas that year. And so we came to Georgia where my mom lives and you see that little skinny Charlie Brown tree on the right side. Like she does Christmas, you know, it's basic, right? Simple, here are a couple gifts, Christmas. Um, and so I'm thinking, this is great. Like we're in Georgia, we can't take a lot of gifts home. We can celebrate, it's all good. Um, uh oh, Alex, okay, all right, all right. <clears throat> all right, I'll, I'll remember that we've got young people in the room. So. My son comes up and he asks me this. We're not going to give it away. Is Santa real? Now, for those of you that have children and, and celebrate Christmas, you know, this is the question where you just, you don't want them to ever ask you this, right? So what do you think my response was in the chat? What do you think? What, what did I say? What do you think? Yeah, I'm not gonna tell them. I'm gonna say, what do you think? Right? Like, what, can you prove, right? Real time? Yes. What do you think? Son, do you think? Right. And so I'm sort of, you know, he says, Well, I think grown-ups eat the cookies and milk. I don't know. But how does he get to every kid's house in one night? And then he says, I guess I believe. 51, 52%. I kid you not. 51, 52%. And so I'm thinking, that's my child. So he, from my womb, like this is my offspring. Um, and I calmly say to him, listen, don't, don't forget your margin of error. You know, have I not taught you anything? You can't just throw out a number and not give a range. Like what's a number without son? Help me out. Um, so, so data science begins at home, right? This idea of mathematical thinking is cultivated in in the home um so i hear him go over to his younger brother noah and he says noah i have an idea of how we can prove how santa is real and um he says you know what when we get home if we've got gifts under the tree then um we're gonna know that santa is real and of course i'm thinking my children are doing hypothesis testing they have set up a hypothesis they're really like either Santa is not real or Santa is real. And we're gonna collect data. We're gonna collect evidence to determine if Santa is real or not. And I look back on this because if you, if you think about some of the ways in which society is plagued currently, you know, some of it has to do with, um, global warming, right? When you, you know, we can look at the data, we can look at the evidence and we can say, oh, global warming is real. Here's how it's affecting the climate. Here's what we need to do. Um, but, but sometimes when people don't have that, that mathematical reasoning, right, that scientific reasoning, 
they don't come to problems in the same way, right? And so looking at data, looking at evidence doesn't always convince them. And so I was really happy to see that my boys were like, what can we do to gather data? What can we do to prove or disprove our point? Um, so we've got some young people in the room. And so I'll just say when we got home, Santa, our, our Santa neighbor had showed up and left some amazing toys for the boys. And so they were so excited to get home and see that Santa showed up, um, even at their house in, uh, in, in California. And you could see, look at that excitement on my face. That was so genuine. That was genuine because we were all surprised that Santa showed up. Um, secondly, you know, how can we engage audience in the beauty of STEM community engagement? So as we step outside of our neighborhood, as we try to bring people from the community into mathematics, what does that look like? For me, it really looked like um, reaching out, you know, I'm in Southern California, and yet when I got to Harvey Mudd, there were, there were literally five Black students, like total, freshmen through seniors. I, I, I kid you not, there were five. And I was just thinking, we're in Southern California. Why do we not have more students of color at this amazing STEM institution? Like, what can I do to try to change that? And so I started a conference, an annual STEM conference for girls of color, um, brought them to campus to have, you know, a, a day of STEM activity. And um, we got featured in Forbes about just creating opportunities for minorities in STEM, having, uh, we did like uh, fluid workshops to talk about uh, mathematical fluids and dynamical equations. And it was just so amazing to get featured and to highlight these girls from Southern California. Each year that we've done the conference, uh, we often uh, try to bring in women who are scientists, mathematicians, engineers, computer scientists to speak. Um, we also give the girls an opportunity to sort of share what's on their mind, to hear um, you know, what they think about mathematics. I think this year we were asking like, what's your inspiration equation? You know, what goes into really inspiring you? Because often it's more than just a love of math, right? There's so many parts of them that make them a whole person. And we really wanted to talk about those different parts. And then there's always that like small group time, that small mentorship time. I think about my time with Claudia and how I would spend, you know, days with her and she would just mentor me that one-on-one -on -one mentorship. So I thought, why not try to duplicate that and give these girls a chance to really get to know the women and, and um, their profession and get excited and see themselves in the field, right? Because not everyone's going to have a Spelman College experience. Not everyone's going to have an Etta Faulkner. But on this day, I want them to see themselves as mathematicians, as data scientists. Um, the first year that we did that I did this conference, <clears throat> I was really thinking parents were just going to come and like drop their kids off and come back at three, right? Like, thank you, eight to three, we'll see you later. And parents, like 80% of them hung around because they were just like, I'm not dropping my baby girl off on this college campus. I don't know where these boys are. Like, I'm not leaving. <laughs> so we had parents just like sitting around and I was like, okay, you can stay. Please just don't eat the food because we don't have enough food for you. So after that, we um, we started a parent workshop. And, you know, what I found was that in some ways, the parent workshop was even more important than the workshop for the girls. Because when the girls go back, it's the parents that are sort of doing the hard work of keeping them motivated and keeping them excited about math. And so we gave the parents resources. You know, here are the top 10 questions to ask your daughter's guidance counselor. Here's a homework hotline number to, for help with math, right? What do you say? We did role playing. Your daughter comes home. I can't do this math problem. This is so hard. What do you say? A lot of parents would be like, oh, well, I don't, you don't need that to be like, I've made it through life and I don't know calculus. You can too. And we would be like, no, no, let's practice. That is not what you say, right? And so just helping parents realize that the seeds that they plant can be positive or negative. Um, so we'd have our parents do role play. Like, how do you support your child when you really have no idea how to do trigonometry, right? Okay, well, go back to the point where you understand and then you teach it to me, right? Keep explaining it, right? You know, ways to help their kids get it. And so I love this quote that a parent said, I most enjoyed seeing the excitement and wonder in each young woman as they sat at the footstools of the women who were practicing and actualizing their dreams. So this was so amazing. Um, a couple years ago, I thought, why not invite 
Claudia Alexander, like, hello, the whole conference was basically formed around my interaction with Dr. Alexander. This was so special. Um, these were like the photos where I was like the least, the least expression, right? The other ones, uh, you know, there's mouth and all just, and so um, I was so excited to see her and reconnect with her. She was right still down the street at JPL and I'm, you know, literally 25 minutes away. And so it was so great to have her come. She was, she's working on the Cassini mission at the time and just pour into these girls in the same way that she had poured into me, you know, 20 years ago. And so it was beautiful. Um, I got to catch up with her after the conference and talk about some of the things that she was working on. And she's like, oh, I'm working on these children's books. And I'm just thinking, Claudia, like you don't have, you know, a million other things to do at JPL, you're writing children's books. And she said, well, Talithia, yes, like ha we have to get the next generation excited about STEM. Like I want them excited about space and I need to, you know, leave that behind so that we can really um, bring, invite everyone into this field so that they can see themselves in this field. It was so special for me to have this time with her because what I didn't know was that not three months later, we were going to lose Claudia. She actually had breast cancer, died of breast cancer, um, two months and two weeks after she spoke at our conference. And I, I used to always like not be able to make it through this slide. This is like the you know saddest slide of the talk. Um, but but and fifty six years old, right? Just young, vibrant, full of life. And I remember when I saw her, she was walking with a cane, and I was just thinking, like, well, why is Cla like Claudia? Why do you have a cane? You know, like what you know and and we had to walk down the stairs because we were in the you know big hall and I said well you know I was like I can take you around to the elevator like you know and when she started speaking in front of those girls she like lit up she put the cane down and she was just going and sharing her passion with them and it was so beautiful to see that side of her come out and I was like if anyone had an excuse to decline a keynote it's someone who's like you know what cancer's ravaging my body I'm not going to be able to come and speak but she didn't, she came and she poured into these girls. Um, and so that really just inspired, that continues to inspire me. It gives me goosebumps to talk about um, seeing her in that very frail state and yet she still just poured herself out to those girls. Last thing I wanna leave you with is really engaging um, people in the beauty of STEM through national engagement. And this was so unexpected for me. I don't think this was um, you know, any, any way that I thought about reaching people. Um, the TEDx talk that I did in 2014, um, it was a local Claremont Colleges TED talk, TEDx talk, um, which was probably given to a room of, I don't know, maybe 150 students. And um, to see where that talk has, has since gone, you know, there's a picture of my husband in the bathroom. I probably wouldn't have put that up had I known it would be translated into 25 languages and seen almost 2 million times, but you know, hindsight. Um, but really for me, uh, when I agreed to do this talk, it was it was because one of my students was on the organizing committee and she was just kind of like, Prof. Williams, I think you'd be good and we need more Harvey Mudd students to come. So can you do it? Like it was, you know, that was like, <laughs> that was the selling point. The topic was storytelling. And I'm just thinking, I'm not storytelling. Like what? I don't tell stories. Like I'm a math professor. What in the world? Um, and so I thought, well, if anything, this talk will give me practice on giving a sort of public general audience talk. It'll be good practice. And that was really all that I thought would come of this TEDx talk. Um, but it has since become its own thing, you know, owning your body's data. And so the TED talk really talks about how the data that we collect about our bodies, how we can use it to really make informed decisions. When we share it with our doctor, we can both be making very informed decisions uh, about our health. And so um, uh, I also got to author this book, Power in Numbers, The Rebel Women of Mathematics. I didn't want that to be the subtitle, if I'm honest. I really wanted it to be um, women mathematicians with additude, like add, do you get, you want me to put it in the chat? Additude, yeah attitude add thank you thank you yes thank you Christian I, I loved it too and the publisher was just like nobody's gonna get it I'm like it's so punny it's so it's like on the back of the book 
And I was like, nobody was, were they really rebelling? I guess kind of. Anyway, um, one of the women that gets highlight in the book is uh, Winifred Merrill. She was the first woman to officially get her PhD. That's a, that's the a second story. Winifred was uh, at Columbia and had to petition to even get accepted to the PhD program. Um, after she got accepted, the board said, yes, you can be in the PhD program, but you can't take any classes with the guys. So they gave her a syllabus and a book and she had to study on her own. It was basically, basically like independent study grad school. And she took all the exams um, that they took without being in class. She also worked on her, her thesis by herself um, and defended it and then had to petition the board again to get the PhD that she had earned because they, did, they were like, we're not gonna go down as the first institution to give a PhD to a woman. And so she had to petition to get her PhD. Um, it was a monumental feat. There was an article that came out in the New York Times when she graduated. Notice that it said she was modestly dressed in a walking dress of dark brown stuff trimmed with velvet of the same material and wore a brown chip hat, which had a pompon of white lace and feathers. So I want you to get your PhD and like your institution published, like, but, but what did Stephanie have on when she graduated? Like, what was Deborah's dress? That's what we really want to know. Like, who cares? She's the first woman to get a PhD in math. And yet this article is about what she wore. Um, one pleasure in writing the book was to really get to highlight all of the amazing women who have come before us and up and coming women. Uh, Catherine Johnson, the late now late Catherine Johnson is also featured in the book. And, you know, um, in the bottom left corner there, you see a picture from the Ath Apollo 13 um, in the mission control room. And you'll notice that there were no women in the mission control room. And so um, I got to sort of dig and find some old NASA pictures of women who were working the women computers who were working in the background, um, who never got featured, right? We never saw the contributions of these women. And yet many of them were, um, were a huge part of our space race. Um, this is uh, Melba Roy who uh, tracked echo satellites in the 60s. Uh, here's another picture of Katherine Johnson. This is at her desk in front of a celestial training device. Um, and a more recent picture, Christine Darden, who's currently retired, but still, still here with us. She, um, she's also sometimes on the speaking circuit. Uh, she was an aeronautical engineer at NASA as well. And so highlighting her story and some of the ways that she um, struggled and persisted during her time at NASA. Um, the third, uh, the third uh, portion of the book looks at sort of up and coming mathematicians. I call them the modern math mavens. And Eugenia Chang is one of the mathematicians that I got to feature and highlight, one of, one of my friends. And um, here you see her on the Stephen Colbert show. Um, and Eugenia is just such a great, vibrant personality who really just um, loves mathematics and loves engaging people in mathematics. And so it's been great to get to know her. I love that when she talks about math, she says it's not about finding the right answer. It's really about exploration and investigation, right? Not memorization. Because when you think about what is it that people hate about math, it's part of the, you know, thinking that, oh, I just have to memorize formula. I don't know how I'm going to use this. What's exciting about this? And so really to see Eugenia talk about it, um, it just lights me up and it lights other people up as well. Um, as was mentioned earlier, I got, I've had the joy of working with PBS um, and with Nova. <coughs> Growing up in Georgia, we didn't have cable. So um, I would often come home and just turn on PBS because that's all we would watch. And so when folks at PBS reached out about the possibility of doing the show, I was like, well, this must be spam. <laughs> um, and then when I realized it wasn't, I was like, okay, I'd love to. <coughs> um, but almost like, why me? Like, you know, I'm not like this awesome math researcher, you know, I teach at an undergraduate institution. And, you know, they were just like, you know, Talithia, we did a great job of showing little boys that they could be scientists and engineers in the 80s and the 90s. And we really want to present, math, you know, scientists that come in all shades and sizes. And, um, and we want you to help us do that. And so I, I was really excited to partner with, with PBS. The initial Nova Wonder series is a six-part episode, uh, six-part show. 
um, that really tried to tackle some of the biggest questions that are at the frontier of, of science. So like, what are animals saying? What's living in you? Can we build a brain? Um, what's the universe made of? And so I got to co-host uh, with two others, but anytime there was anything related to data or math or statistics, I got to sort of come on screen as the expert. So it was exciting to be a co-host and then also to be the expert. So there's a picture of me, I don't know, talking about something. Um, I, I, I will say that my, my profession, you know, being a professor is very different than being a host of a show. And there were several times that they had to remind me of that because I would be like reading the prompt, like, oh, and here we see dark, dark matter, blah, blah, blah. And they were just like, Talithia, people will turn from you. Like they have the remote. They're not your students. They're not obligated to sit there for an hour and listen. And so they'd be like, you gotta be lively. You gotta be energetic, right? You gotta really excite people and, and make them want to stay tuned and hear what you're saying. Um, so this is a couple of pictures on your left there, me and Julia Court. She's one of the uh, executive uh, producers for Nova. And she's coaching me on, you know, how, how to deliver this line. And then I got to do a lot of voiceover um, as well. And so that was really, really neat to, to drive into LA and, and, and read and, and do voice work. Um, it was a lot of fun. <clears throat> I'm gonna end on a clip, but first I, I wanna give you a heads up of what's coming in this clip. So here I am with Andre Fenton. He's a neurobiologist at NYU. He was another one of the co-hosts. And we taped this series in Boston, in the design district. So downtown Boston in like an open, just sort of warehouse, you can see. And the first day I got there, I'm thinking, like PBS obviously has no budget. They really do need people to donate. That's why they're doing these telethons. Poor PBS. Like we are literally in a warehouse <laughs> doing a STEM program, right? And, and they were saying, okay, Talithia, Andre, there's gonna be, you know, we're gonna have a picture of a brain. A brain is gonna just fall down in front of you. And we want you to open your arms up like you're receiving the brain as it lands in front of you. And so to two scientists, you know, Andre are like, we're like, well, what angle? Wait, uh, where do we start? What's the arc? Where do we end? What's the degree, what's the, the radius? You know, we're just like, and they're like, just feel it. Just open your arms and feel the brain fall down, you know? Um, so that's a clip uh, in this next, uh, next clip. Check it out. Inside a human brain, there's about a hundred billion neurons. Each one of them can connect to 10,000 others. And from these connections comes Here it is. everything. <laughs> the human brain can compose symphonies, create beautiful works of art. It allows us to navigate our world, to probe the universe, and to invent technology that can do amazing things. Now, some of that technology is aimed at replicating the brain that created it artificial intelligence, or AI. But has it even come close to what these babies can do? For ages, computers have done impressive stuff. They crack codes, master chess, operate spacecraft. But in the last few years, something has changed. Suddenly, computers are doing things that can seem much more human. Today, computers can see, understand speech, even write poetry. How is all this possible? And how far will it go? Could we actually build a machine that's as smart as us? One that can imagine, create, even learn on its own? How would a machine like that change society? How would it change us? I'm Rana El Kayubi. I'm Andre Fenton. I'm Talithia Williams. And in this episode, Nova Wonders. Can we build a brain? And if we could, should we? Awesome. Thank you all so much for your time today. And I'm happy to take questions.